Hello Mr Size, tell me about your curriculum in basket weaving and what it is that you're trying to achieve beyond just just getting students to GCSE. Well, when we reviewed our curriculum last year, we were really keen to make our students as brilliant as basket weaving as possible. And obviously we're passionate about the subject and we know that the skills that you develop in basket weaving, basket weaving actually apply to making all kinds of other structures. You know, so for example, you could make a whole dining room uh, set of furniture out of willow using exactly the same techniques with a few modifications. So we started out really ambitiously thinking, what are the skills and knowledge that we need our students to have? And we've developed that from year seven all the way through so that when we get to years 10 and 11, we also teach them the extra exam specific skills, but they're what the exam board require rather than what we particularly value as making them expert in design and making so that they could carry these skills on well into adult life and derive great pleasure from making useful objects of their own. Thank you. Well, what does that actually look like in the curriculum? Talk me through it. Well, there are essentially three core shapes that students need to be able to master in order to develop any three-dimensional object. So we spend a lot of time in year seven working through designing triangles, squares and circles and working out different ways that these fit together to make 3D objects, be they chairs, baskets, tables, model houses, whatever they are. And we plan a sequence that really carefully takes the students through basic principles that be build up to a level of mastery. We've also thought through really carefully about what kinds of fine motor skills that they need. So you'll see a lot of practicing lessons done at speed where students are working with simpler materials like wire and straw um, to make these shapes in a much more accelerated pace so that they can develop these fine motor skills really quickly. You'll see a lot of that in our DNAs and our homeworks. In year seven, eight, nine, our students do almost no writing whatsoever. Writing is just a requirement of the GCSE. It's something that the government has imposed on the, imposed on the exam boards. But of course, skilled craftsmen never have to write about their craft. So we ignore that, year seven, eight, and nine. And we know that we'll be able to nail that in the latter part of year 10 and year 11. Year seven, eight, and nine are entirely devoted to crafting, making, designing, and improving. And you'll see that we move through our design in an iterative way. So students don't need perfection. What they need is continual improvement. And how do you sequence your curriculum so that students get better at the things you've described? Well, if you look at our year seven curriculum, for example, you'll see that we start with the basic principle of a square. It's much easier to move from a square than into a triangle. Uh, so we teach the square first and that builds the student's dexterity and exactitude. We're really, really keen on modeling and students have to be able to do exactly what we tell them. So we're really precise about uh, what we want students to do so they can clearly see it and measure themselves against the finished artifact that we provide as a model. Squares are the easiest shapes to link together, so we integrate into that different kinds of stitching and different kinds of knots with different kinds of materials. And these are the essential building blocks that they will need to design larger structures as they move through year seven and into year eight. And the same principles will be applied when they strengthen these structures with triangles and then vary that with circles. So you can tell from that that we teach triangles next in our sequence and then we teach circles. And then finally, we teach uh, freestanding spheres or cylinders. And that's all done in year seven and sequenced in that order because it builds mastery. And how do you build long-term memory so that students retain what you teach them? Well, that's partly achieved through our sequencing as I've described. Uh, activities in later weeks rehearse activities that we did in earlier weeks uh, so there's constant retrieval practice that way we have a school policy of DNAs and we split that into two categories some is just subject knowledge quizzing facts that we need them to know about the application the design the mathematics involved um, the sourcing of materials those sorts of things and they're done through low stakes quizzing for homework and as DNAs 
But the other thing that we really need to develop is the manual dexterity at speed, because we find that students often don't finish projects in time. And so we have really quick five to 10 minute bursts of uh, making things using wire, because that's the most malleable material. And it can be undone again really easily in order to be used next lesson. And our DNAs increase the level of challenge over time and students record their personal best so that they can see how much better they're becoming. Thank you. I've heard a lot about um, space learning and interleaving and how your senior leaders have tried to introduce that into the curriculum. Can you tell me how that works in your subject and how it builds memory? Well, space learning is simply the idea that you have to retest knowledge after increasing gaps. You'll see that in our quizzing and our DNA activities. Interleaving is a bit more interesting. So it says that if you disrupt somebody's learning um, by introducing a new bit of learning when they're still processing the old, then they will learn both better. And the way we do that is we have one lesson in our fortnightly cycle where students do not work on their existing project, they worked on a new project in wire where students reconstruct a living room with five key pieces of furniture. Now, those bits of furniture will all use the same skills that they're learning elsewhere in the curriculum, but they're implied in a much different way with different materials and, of course, in miniature. So it really forces them to develop precision. Uh, and you'll see this pattern all the way through the curriculum. And how do you model what success looks like so that students make rapid progress towards a high standard? Uh, there are two main ways. The first is show call. So we use a visualizer all the time and you'll see regularly in lessons, in every single lesson, students work displayed under a visualizer and examined for other students to comment on. And we go through the successes and the failures that way. And it's a great way to give feedback to the whole class on stuff that's relevant to everybody. The second way that we do it is we've used videos. Traditionally, in a practical subject, you're used to teachers giving a demonstration. But the problem with that is the teacher has to invent it every time and students very rarely can get the same view. So we've circumnavigated that problem by filming uh, every single demonstration that we need. This allows us to keep the demonstration short, they're precise and quality controlled, and crucially, the students can come back to them again and again they never forget what they've been shown. Uh, so that model always exists and students can constantly self-correct. And then finally, we celebrate successes um, every five weeks and we get our winners, um, five students normally, uh, making a two minute video with their finished piece explaining how they achieved what they did. And so those models also exist for all students when they themselves do one of these five projects. And how do your assessments actually help you get the students to improve and make greater progress? Well, you've seen how assessment happens constantly through DNAs and show call during lessons. Our formal assessments allow us to test whether what we've been teaching actually works. So we give students particular tasks to do over two lessons under time pressure, and then they can genuinely see whether they're improving or not. And we as a department get together and look at the finished artefacts and decide which skills we haven't taught as well as we could have. And from that, we'll probably make a new demo video. And we have also started to develop misconception videos where we show kids typical errors and the consequences of those errors. Uh, we didn't realise how useful that would be at the start, so that's an area that we're developing. And then, of course, there is that body of knowledge I alluded to in quizzes, uh, so every four weeks, we just take the last four weeks' homeworks and get a sample of those questions to test students on for their knowledge retrieval. And we can see over time where the weaknesses are and where the strengths are and adjust our DNAs accordingly or our quizzes if we have to. And how does your homework integrate into this curriculum? Well, aside from the knowledge testing, every six weeks we have a show me homework where the students are encouraged to display some skills in a way that they choose. So they create an object that they want to bring in to demonstrate their improvement since the last Show Me homework. And obviously we video the winners of those and they are used to improve the next iteration of that homework in six weeks time. And how does your curriculum suit all learners, especially uh, SEN students? Yes, there are a number of ways which I've already described. 
So you've seen how we focus on the fine motor skills with our DNA activities and our sequencing. The competition that students have in terms of personal bests really reinforces those skills. And obviously the sequencing of our activity builds towards mastery. The other ways that students constantly are able to self-correct is through the videos and the models that we produce where students are able to measure their own progress against the finished artifact or the particular parts of the artifact that they're completing. And then obviously we've designed a curriculum that takes out the fluff, if you like, where we don't write at all, as I said, in year seven, eight and nine. Students just get more and more goes at making. So even students with really poor motor skills at the start quickly make progress. Of course, we don't expect them necessarily to catch up with um, students who just have more advantages than them. But what you will see is that they constantly improve and reach a really high standard, as our SEM results show. And how do you make sure that all your teachers, including non-specialists, deliver that high standard of teaching that you want? Well, we all teach common lessons at the same pace. And the easiest way to keep well, we all teach common lessons at the same pace, and the easiest way to keep to the same pace is to have common assessment points and common DNAs. And by and large, that means that um, teachers are never more than one or two lessons out of sequence. Obviously, uh, we learning walk within the department, but actually we found that's mainly to improve aspects of delivery and you know, to pick some ideas that someone's using it and transfer them quickly across the rest of the of the department. And the other way, the main way really, is these videos that we've made. So teachers no longer have to demonstrate in a slow and clunky way. They've got really precise videos and for non-specialists it teaches them how to do it as well. And what are your areas for development? Well we've really been thinking about our higher attaining students and how we can get them to even higher grades and better progress. And so this year we're developing a real life project where each student will develop three artifacts for sale. We're renting a stall at four craft markets where we will offer each of these for sale. Um, students know this in advance and they cannot choose not to enter a product. So we're hoping that this will dramatically raise the um, impetus in what our more able students can achieve. And that also ties in to our links with the community uh, where we've taken them out to meet local craftsmen and they've actually had a conversation with them. And obviously we've videoed that with quite specific advice on not just how to be creative in your design, but actually to make it marketable. How to design something that people need and therefore also will see a design they want to buy. Uh, so really, I guess we've used outside experts in order to help us uh, teach that that's really a slightly beyond our level of um, subject expertise um, hitherto. Well Mr Salis, I'm glad I've caught you. So can you tell me over the last year what your impressions are of the workload that's been imposed on you? Ah oh, right, yeah well I'm glad you asked me that. So last year we used to have curriculum improvement time which was brilliant. It meant that we could really break the back of our planning of the curriculum Often we did that in pairs, and what it meant was I would prepare year 11, colleague would prepare year 9. That was intense last year, I'm not going to lie. But what it means is that this year I don't have to plan my year 9 lessons or my year 11 lessons and so on, because it's already been done for me. That's a fantastic saving in workload. Other kinds of savings in workload that we had were things like the Shoma homework quizzes, which get marked for you and the rankings are produced for you. Uh, so colleagues would set homework for each other, that saves a massive amount of time, but also the marking goes away because that's done for you as well. The new marking policy's been a real boon because it means that we don't now have to write loads in books. We're marking live using the visualizers that you'll see and tracking, not watching, to work out how to feed back to the whole class. Training the students in using the green pen to think about what we're telling them is a huge saving in our marking time. Um, now, last year, I'm not going to lie, was a bit intense. We had too many interventions going on and teachers were pulled from pillar to post a bit. But this year, there's a much calmer, more measured, rational approach. So interventions have started early. We, we can see them mapped out. We know where they're going. We know we're not going to be suddenly dramatically 
pulled doing this and that. And the other advantage is that the SLT knew they couldn't keep funding the curriculum improvement time, so they guaranteed us lots of training time on our training days, and that's protected. Uh, so the last three training days we've had, they haven't tried to interfere with me as a head of department and tell me what my agenda had to be. I was able to look at my department and actually give them the time that they needed to develop the curriculum, which we're still developing.